We have a closer look at one woman's deportation battle. We first met Maria over a month ago when Detroit Public Television did a show in southwest Detroit. You know, we're always listening for stories and we're trying to connect with communities to learn and find issues that we should be looking at. Well, a lot of people in that community were talking about their concerns about immigration and deportation. And that's where we found out about Maria from her attorney. Maria has been living in the U.S. since she was a baby. And she now lives in southwest Detroit with her own family. And she's set to be deported by the end of the month. We wanted to walk through the process and see exactly how things worked, what changed, why she has to leave now. So here at One Detroit, we teamed up with Bridge Magazine, our reporting partners with the Detroit Journalism Cooperative. This isn't a story about President Trump's current policies or President Obama's past ones, and it's not also as black and white as you would think it would be. But it's a unique look at one family's navigation of the system as it is happening right now. Maria Garcia Juarez lives in southwest Detroit with her husband Eric and one and a half year old son David. They are U.S. citizens, but she's not. Born in Mexico, arriving with her mother undocumented at just eight months old. America is all she knows. So in three weeks, what happens? I have to leave the country or they will come and get me. I have to go back to my officer on the 16th of this month and I have to show her a ticket leaving before the 25th of this month. Going where? To Mexico, straight to Mexico. Who do you know there? Nobody. I know I have family there. I don't know them. I don't have communication with them, but I have to go. You have to buy your own ticket. Yes, they, I mean, they can purchase it for me. Mm -hmm. They said they can purchase it for me, but they're gonna purchase it wherever they want. They're gonna throw me anywhere. Have you bought a ticket? No, I have not. I haven't bought it yet. Where are you gonna go? To be completely honest, I don't know right now. I really do not know. I'm still hopeful that a miracle can happen, something can happen. I knew I could make you smile. <laughs> when the day comes, Maria doesn't want to take her son with her. David has medical issues she fears can't be treated in Mexico. An even bigger complication? In January, her husband was diagnosed with leukemia. He's getting special treatments just to stay alive. Maria might have been a typical DACA case, someone who came to America as a child and now is allowed to stay. But at 17, she was arrested in Salinas, California, where she used to live. I committed a crime. I was in a stolen vehicle. I was caught in a stolen vehicle twice. Maria was behind the wheel, even leading police on a high-speed chase. Gangs and crime were a part of life in Salinas. Her mother was arrested, then deported, while Maria and her sister were placed in the care of a family with its own criminal connections. As young, naive little girls, we really didn't know anything better. I mean, we grew up around that environment. We saw our mother doing it, and our dad was never in the picture, so what was there to expect? Maria was released from juvenile detention at the age of 18, joining an aunt and sister in Michigan. It's when we were really, really small. These past five years, Maria's been something of a model citizen, gainfully employed, taking college classes, but always under the watch of immigration and customs enforcement. She's got a tether, so they always know where she is. When it's green, it's, it's good. That means they have signal. I mean, I guess I have to be grateful that at least I'm, I'm here with this instead of being in jail. Maria's husband, Eric, has lost his hair from chemotherapy, so he's camera shy, but he wants to talk. He's 22 years old. The truth is that in the next few weeks, my wife is gonna be gone. I gotta figure out how I'm gonna do with my son. <laughs> gotta figure out how I'm gonna do with my sickness. Try to stay strong. The story you just saw really is just a first step to understanding the process. We know that you have a lot of questions too, and we want to put this in context. So with me now is the reporter for Bridge on the Story, Chastity Pratt. Jazzy Chastity, it's good to see you. Hey. <laughs> 
It's good. interesting, right? Yeah, it sure is. And also with us is Diego Bonasade. He's the legal director for Michigan United, an organization that helps people with immigration issues. Diego, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Chastity, let me start with you. When you started reporting the story and talking with Maria and speaking really with immigration attorneys, looking at her case and surrounding everything, how would you characterize how her story is playing into the larger conversation that we're having all across the state, really in the country, about immigration and about the processes that people are going through in deportation. Well, since the new administration has um, taken office, and, and Diego, you can attest to this, there's been a lot of concern, a lot of conversation, obviously because the Trump administration has changed the policies that were in place during the Obama administration. Now, the thing about uh, Maria's case is her case very definitely started under the former administration. She got the notice in June that she, she was going to have to go back to She got a notice last year, year that mm -hmm. she could voluntarily um, leave. And she didn't. She kept appealing and appealing and appealing. And in April, she got what could be the last word saying, you know, it's time to go by the end of May. And her lawyer believes that had this been the former administration and the former policies that prioritized who would be targeted for a deportation, then maybe she would have uh, been able to uh, stay and adjust her status differently. But um, that's not the case here. So we're, you're seeing um, a priority change. And Diego, I want to ask you about that momentarily. But Chastity, I do before I want before I leave you, talk a little bit about the numbers. And you talked to ICE, a spokesperson from there. Tell us a little bit about what the numbers we're seeing in terms of deportations and people with criminal backgrounds who are being asked to leave the country or told to leave the country. Right. Um, here in uh, the Detroit ICE um, office deals with Michigan and Ohio. And since October 1st, there's been about 1,400, nearly 1,500 people deported from Michigan and Ohio, and uh, about half of those have been uh, people with criminal records. And that's on pace to be 50% higher than the prior year. So, Diego, we said at the beginning of the story, you know, this is part of the legacy of the Obama administration because obviously it was triggered that Maria would have to leave last June. But we're also looking at now what policies from the Trump administration are, are we looking at that are affecting people who are concerned about having to leave the country. What are you seeing in terms of a priority change and who is being asked to leave? So uh, one part of it is the priority change originally under the Obama administration, number one was national security. Uh, terrorism, spies, saboteurs. Number two was people with serious felony records. Number three was repeat immigration offenders, people who'd been deported and re returned. Um, now, when you look at the Trump administration, it says people convicted of anything. So that could include people with misdemeanor, you know, driving without a license or driving without proof of insurance or that kind of thing. People accused and people suspected uh, so they're going way farther in terms of uh, comparison to the, to the Obama administration. And while they may increase their numbers, I think they may be focusing less on people with serious records. Uh, the Trump administration, for example, there's a unit that in, in Homeland Security of about 6,200 uh, field agents that investigate human trafficking, drug trafficking and other serious crimes that take longer term investigations. They want to turn those people towards picking up random uh, undocumented immigrants. So if they do that, if you're going to take your eye off that ball and, and go to just general deportations, something's going to suffer, right? Something's got to give. And so the people with more serious criminal records, in my opinion, uh, we're going to be seeing fewer of those and larger numbers of people with with no records at all. Uh, so how is Maria's story typical or, or not typical? Or is it something that when you cover something like this and we're talking about this issue, there is really no such thing as a typical story? It's, it, so what, uh, I mean, what's kind of out of, uh, I mean, I'm surprised that even with a juvenile uh, criminal record uh, that she's stayed so long, but she really has a compelling case, right? I mean, this is, um, she's got a family now. Uh, her husband is suffering an illness. She has a child. Um, it, from what I saw, and, and I'm, I'm not uh, confirmed, but it sounds like she would be able to immigrate. And part of the problem is that they want her to leave, and then she's going to have to consular process, and you're going to have a year-long 
maybe more separation. I was just gonna say, how long, right. how long that process is if she wanted to try to come back into the country because she's got a child here? It's, it's gonna be, I'd figure, just, just given the paperwork that has to happen, I'd figure at least a year. Um, and and that's, that's part of the issue. It's like, what is it going, she, if she's already paid for those offenses when she was a juvenile, um, what is the country gonna gain from separating this family at this moment uh, of you know a child who needs assistance here and then a husband who is facing leukemia and I think that's what the the, the bigger conversation is also in this chastity in doing this story and in, in bridge publishing this story and I think rounding out a lot of um, the emotional part of the story and hearing mm -hmm. Maria's story but backing it up with a lot of the numbers that are surrounding that this is um, a, a situation that many people face or they're concerned about different parts of their history coming coming back and affecting where they are now. Right, and and you hit it right on the head. It's, from what I can tell, and I'm in no way an expert, there are so many different scenarios. Every case is different. Every immigration judge or field officer has got to, you know, chime in and, and it can, things can go very differently for very different people. But with Maria, I think the compelling case is just that if our immigration policy is meant to protect national security, is meant to um, you know enforce law and order, really what um, benefit is it to the United States citizenry for her to be to be deported. She's been here since she's an infant and she's sort of like a foreigner here and a foreigner there. And so what, what does the United States gain from her leaving if only to send her there to file paperwork and come back? I would assume that this story is going to spark a lot of questions from families. Diego, what would you tell um, other people that you're working with and other families who have, who have uh, deportation concerns and immigration concerns? I, I mean, first of all, to know what the, the situation is. So if, if a person is not in proceedings, they really need to understand what happens if ICE knocks on their door um, what happens if they're on the verge of fixing their papers? So there's, there's people who've, had, who've been here 20 plus years. Their kids who are born here are turning 21 and that means that they can petition for them. The problem is that if it, it turns into a trap because they can start the first half, the child can petition for them when they're 21, but when they leave, because they've been here for a year or longer without papers, they trigger a 10 year bar to coming back. Mm and they can't get it waived based on the child, right? So there's, there's things that people need to know both about the path they're taking to ultimately uh, fix their papers, as well as what happens when ICE knocks on your door and you know, what mm -hmm. rights do you have and who should you call and what kind of numbers you should memorize. Yeah. You're gonna keep following this, Jessity. Absolutely, she's um, set to leave at the end of the month and folks here at DPTV are going to continue to follow her and we'll be writing about the, uh, the outcome. Chastity pratt Jazzy, Diego Bonasati, thank you so much for joining me. Go to our website, myweek.org, for the link to Chastity's article for Bridge. It will be there. Plus, we will continue to follow this story and update you as things progress. Maybe it has sparked questions for you. You can always tell us what you think on Facebook and on Twitter. That's